Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. This is uh, our basic notion seminars. For those who might not know, we try to have the seminar every month, once a month, and it's meant uh, as a sort of general uh, audience and uh, on a particular topic. My pleasure to introduce Ruth Kellerhas, who has been visiting ICDP, is leaving tomorrow, unfortunately, but if you like to talk to her after the talk, she's still gonna be around. She is from the University of uh, Freiburg in Switzerland, and will talk to us on the many aspects of hyperbolic volumes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Fernando. Do you understand me with this microphone? Oh, yes. Um, first, thank you, uh, Fernando, that I can spend the last part of my short sabbatical here at Trieste. And uh, on the very last day of my stay here, uh, it's an honor for me to speak a little bit about hyperbolic volume, a topic which bothers me since many, many years. And uh, again, I went back to some hard computations, which I even here tried to complete. So um, I, took, I take this serious uh, basic notions uh, seminar. So if it is too elementary, please give me a sign and I can uh, accelerate. If not, then give me another sign and I will explain a little bit more. OK, so uh, let's start. Uh, with the basic notion of hyperbolic space in order to speak about volume of a domain, a measurable domain or a polyhedron in hyperbolic space. Before you read this, um, let me motivate why we do not consider Euclidean space. In Euclidean space, as you know from your studies, when you have a, a polyhedron, a tetrahedron, a simplex, a triangle, a quadrilateral, then you can associate to the vertices of this object, if it is polyhedral, vectors. And uh, to compute the volume of a, of a tetrahedron, for example, it is basically an algebraic task. You look at the gram matrix of your vectors, giving you your polyhedral object, and then the determinant of the gram matrix gives you the volume. So the message is, in Euclidean space, polyhedral volume and therefore other tasks uh, for uh, computing volumes of Euclidean space forms uh, is not so difficult. There, there are still many difficult issues there, but uh, that is the reason why I want to consider non-Euclidean spaces of constant sectional curvature, which means uh, either the sphere, standard unit sphere, so we take triangles, tetrahedra, simplices on the standard n-dimensional sphere, or we look at the negatively curved space, its dual, the hyperbolic space of constant negative curvature minus one. So uh, in order to, to consider volume computations, we have to choose uh, a suitable model uh, to deal with volumes. And there are, maybe you know that, several models how to visualize as a Euclidean being hyperbolic geometry in n dimensions, which makes our life easy when we want to encode a polyhedral object, the tetrahedron, through uh, suitable parameters. So. That's why I start my first slide with uh, the linear vector space model of Lorenz and Minkowski, which uh, deals with representing hyperbolic n-dimensional space as uh, uh, some, oh, I knew that I'm going to mix it up, as uh, it's, it's a connected space, simply connected space, hyperbolic space, as vectors in Rn plus one, but equipped with a symmetric bilinear form of signature N1. So we have uh, N positive signs here and one negative signs. Uh, we have a norm which is associated to this bilinear form. And we look now at vectors in Rn plus one, 
equipped with this bilinear form, so that's the Lorentz-Minkowski space of signature N1, such that the norm squared is minus one, or if you take the norm, it's imaginary, uh, and we take uh, the upper sheet of this uh, hyperboloid model and uh, ask that the last uh, coordinate is positive. So we take here vectors ending in this sheet, and uh, all these vectors give us points of hyperbolic space. This has a lot of advantages, this model for the standard hyperbolic space, because when we look now at geodesics, paths uh, where we walk on with, with uh, minimal distances, or geodesic hyperplanes, uh, we can uh, encode them with vectors or normal vectors very easily, and we are very close to the other constant curvature case, the sphere, which we can embed in Rn plus 1. Uh, so we, there we have also a vector space model. And the geodesic k-dimensional planes in, in this uh, Minkowski uh, linear model for Hn is you take a linear space through zero of dimension k plus one, you intersect it with this upper sheet of the hyperboloid, and the intersection gives you a k-dimensional geodesic plane. So for k equal to two, you take a two-dimensional plane through zero, you intersect, and what you get here, uh, you can see it, the intersection with the plane gives you a geodesic line. So uh, that's very convenient. And when we take a hyperplane, so we take an n-dimensional, um, uh, oh, here should be uh, n plus 1. We intersect a hyperplane with hyperbolic space. We can associate to this hyperplane a normal vector. Say uh, it is orthogonal to, to your hyperplane. Uh, it is not a hyperbolic vector. It lies outside our cone, uh, and uh, we can assume that this vector has Lorentz norm plus one. And in this way, for each geodesic hyperplane, we have a normal vector, which is here or there of norm one, and we get two oriented half spaces. And let's say uh, in the future we take the negatively oriented closed half space defined by this hyperplane or the normal vector. This is the entry to look at a polyhedral object, which is the intersection of finitely many closed half spaces, meaning we have finitely many normal vectors, unit, unit normal vectors, at giving you a polyhedral object, and that also uh, gives us a Gram matrix, the matrix formed by the products, the Lorentz uh, products of these, of all pairs of normal vectors appearing when you look at these hyperplanes. This is very convenient when you want to do polyhedral geometry, and uh, uh, also when you want to treat isometries having in mind or being motivated by studying spherical geometry where we know the orthogonal group gives us, when restricted to the sphere, the full group of isometries. Here, the full group of isometries is the connected component of the unit element of this uh, positive or projectivized Lorentz orthogonal matrices, PO0N1, which are defined by regular matrices with real coefficients, satisfying uh, this, um, here also I, I made a mistake, that should be a J. With J, this um, matrix where you have the nth identity matrix and here minus one. So the fact which we have also for the orthogonal group ON and the sphere is every isometry being represented by such a matrix can be written as a finite composition of reflections with respect to hyperplanes. And in this model, this fact can be easily proven in a course in the third year 
undergraduate uh, uh, geometry course. So message, every hyperbolic isometry is a finite composition of reflections with respect to hyperplanes. So when we look at groups of isometries, or groups acting properly discontinuously on hyperbolic space, meaning groups which, when you take a compact sub subset of your hyperbolic space, properly discontinuously acting means that this compact set is basically pushed away uh, from itself um, and that gives us discreteness in any ordinary sense. So when you look at discrete groups of hyperbolic isometries whose orbit spaces uh, gives us orbifolds, or when they are even without fixed points, manifolds, then the easiest case to look at is, let's look at discrete groups generated by finitely many reflections. These are called hyperbolic coxet groups. So a hyperbolic coxet group I hope you can read it. Gamma in ESOM HN is a discrete group of isometries, I don't repeat it, generated by finitely many reflections, finitely many reflections with respect to hyperplanes. And uh, it is not difficult to see that when you have such a discrete reflection group, that its fundamental domain, which contains for every orbit one point either in, in, in the interior, or if you close by taking the boundary, parts of the boundary of your polyhedral object, such fundamental polyhedra are characterized by dihedral angles. So if you take two intersecting hyperplanes, uh, the intersection is of co-dimension two. You take a normal plane anywhere in the intersection, and you see the dihedral angle as two-dimensional spherical angle. All these dihedral angles uh, are of the form pi over k. So they lead to polyhedra, or coxet of polyhedra, p, in Hn with dihedral angles, angles. Pi over k. k, an integer bigger than one. So here, uh, comes a, a very natural explanation that uh, such polyhedra, when they are very nice, formed by few bounding hyperplanes, all dihedral angles of the form pi over 2, pi over 3, pi over 4, etc., they belong to very nice discrete group actions, and their um, quotient spaces are modeled uh, according to these polyhedra. And it turns out, I hope I can explain this to, uh, just a little bit today, that coxet to polyhedra with very few bounding hyperplanes, so in n dimensions that means at least n plus one hyperplanes, has to be a simplex, a triangle, a tetrahedron. In three dimensions it has four bounding hyperplanes. Uh, an n-dimensional simplex is bounded by n plus one bounding hyperplanes. So when you take a coxet group with a minimal number of generating reflections, then this gives you very nice polyhedra, 
And it turns out, nowadays we know that, up to a certain high dimension, that such coxeter polyhedra with a minimal number of bounding hyperplanes and large dihedral angles give us minimal volume quotient spaces. So this is a natural object, very basic to define, and uh, let's now pass to volume, because I said they give us small volume objects. That the metric is preserved. Yeah, you have a, a constant curvature space, so you have uh, your distances are preserved. The metric? It comes here on this slide. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. So uh, I did not speak about the metric and coordinates in the upper half, in the Lorenz Minkowski space. There, my main point was. Linearity, we have vectors, we have gram matrices and hyperplanes, polyhedral objects. Now, uh, I go a little bit more into the, the quantitative aspects, so I need the metric and the volume element. And uh, there is an isometry preserving uh, the geometric structure of hyperbolic space, which passes to other models where we see angles. And with one isometry, I will not give you the details. Uh, one can pass to the famous upper half space model of Poincaré. I just give you here a two-dimensional picture. So we have here R2, and we look at all points with a second coordinate strictly positive. What is nice about this model, also like in the lorentz minkowski space, where we have this, this uh, sheet of the... Um, par, uh, of the hyperboloid, here we see the boundary at infinity. When, when you add infinity, you have here uh, the ball model of um, Poincaré. And uh, the advantage in this modified model, where we also see the geometry and the curvature of the space somehow, with a little bit of fantasy, is that the line element for hyperbolic geometry becomes uh, very easy to read off. Here you see the line element of Euclidean space, and you divide by this uh, nth coordinate, which is always non-zero, and you divide by the square. So you disturb the Euclidean metric uh, by dividing, and you get the line element of hyperbolic geometry. Knowing this, you know nearly everything, but uh, actual computations, of course, are something else. But from that, you can also deduce by looking at the Euclidean volume element that the hyperbolic volume element is uh, the distortion of the Euclidean one in that sense. By the way, I see that some take notes. If you, if you want to get the slides, I put my email address at the end, and I can send you the, the, sli the, the slides, yeah. Okay, so uh, you see now, looking at this uh, volume element, if you take a domain uh, which is integrable, which is measurable, which has a finite measure, and you want to know its volume, you have to parametrize your... your your domain, it can be very complicated. And then you have to perform this n-fold integration. Uh, that can be very uh, unpleasant. Usually it is highly unpleasant. And if you do the same thing on the sphere, it's even, I think, even more unpleasant. But we have advantages here in, in a hyperbolic space in contrast to the spherical space. We have a boundary at infinity. Why do I say at infinity? Well, if you take with this line element, you can compute the distance between two points. And one does it like that. You take a vertical line starting, say, from zero to infinity, yeah? vertical line, the xn axis, 
And you take two points here, P and Q. Uh, so these are two nice hyperbolic points, and we want to know the distance, the hyperbolic distance. And uh, with this line element, one can compute in a really not difficult way that this hyperbolic distance is given by the natural logarithm function at the absolute value of the nth coordinate of p divided by the nth coordinate of q. So if you exchange the two points, you get the same distance, of course. And uh, that means, in our uh, aim to understand hyperbolic volume computation, one-dimensional volume is given by the characteristic function the logarithm, the natural logarithm, is responsible for hyperbolic lengths, one-dimensional volume. That's completely different to the Euclidean space, of course, but also different to the spherical space. When you think of the sphere, of the, yeah, of the sphere, you have an angle, which is defined by two points on the, on the, on the circle. The distance is given by the arc length, and if uh, you use uh, the cosine function or the tangent function, uh, the arc tangent or the arc cosine is, is much more complicated than just that expression. So hyperbolic geometry has some advantages from the quantitative point of view. But now look at a point, say, Pn, which goes to the boundary. Pn goes to zero. Then this goes to infinity. And uh, that means that these points on the boundary, if you go to infinity or, or to the boundary below with nth coordinate zero, they correspond to points at infinity with infinite distance. You have now the impression this is very bad. Not at all. This is very nice. Because when we study this line element again, when we restrict to a plane at constant height, H or A, positive height, meaning you divide here by A, N, A square, and this part, it disappears, it, there is no changing, then the restriction of this hyperbolic line element to uh, a, vert, a horizontal plane moved up by a distance A is, is Euclidean. We call these hyperplanes horospheres, and they carry in a natural way up to a multiple, a Euclidean structure. That is very nice to have in hyperbolic geometry, Euclidean geometry, and also spherical geometry by taking balls of constant hyperbolic distance from a given point. OK, so this is my first message. Hyperbolic distance is given by the natural logarithm. What can we say about characteristic volume functions in higher dimensions? And there is a, a, there we have to distinguish between even dimensions and odd dimensions. Maybe you know the theorem of Gauss-Bonnet uh, for a space of constant curvature, non-vanishing constant curvature, which says that even dimensional volume is proportional to the Euler characteristic. Yeah. I'm not sure whether you know all this. Yeah, okay, so uh, since time is running, uh, I will not speak about the even dimensional case because the philosophy there, due to uh, Ludwig Schleafly and Knezer, is we can reduce polyhedral volume in even dimensional space constant curvature non-zero, to the computation of lower dimensional spherical volumes. OK. So let's pass to uh, three dimensions. And how to compute volumes for polyhedral objects in higher dimensions, and I, I would like to say odd dimensions. As I said, you can try to integrate over your polyhedral object or whatever you want to, to know. <clears throat> you can perform that, but in most cases you are not, will not be successful. 
In most cases, of course, there are cases you can't be successful. There is a, a wonderful expression uh, when you look at the polyhedron. So don't forget, this is a convex object, finite intersection of closed half spaces uh, where two bounding hyperplanes intersect. When they intersect, then they intersect at the co-dimension two uh, hyperplane, and there you have a nice dihedral angle in the normal space. So a polyhedron, let me draw a picture, say a tetrahedron, bounded by four planes, the hyperplane one opposite to the vertex one, etc. And uh, we have, so here a hyperplane, here a hyperplane, and they intersect in this edge. Normal to this edge, we have planes, tangent plane, uh, a normal plane, and here we see an angle. Let's call this intersection of uh, these two hyperplanes opposite to one, respectively two, with the tetrahedron T, F. And here we have this angle alpha F inside our object, our tetrahedron. And the Schlafly in a spherical case proved in the middle of the 19th century by giving three different proofs, very interesting. Uh, he proved that when you have a polyhedral object like that, it's very simple, it could be much more complicated, and you move a little bit the vertices such that the combinatorial structure is fixed, so it stays a tetrahedron, then of course the dihedral angles change a little bit. We have an infinitesimal changement of the angles, and of course the volume changes. And Schlafly proved in a spherical case that the volume change, of course you, you, you can use that in, in Cartesian coordinates, but in parameters given by the dihedral angles, the volume change is as follows with respect to these dihedral angle changes. You take this change of alpha f and you multiply it with the length of this edge or in higher dimensions with a hyperbolic volume of this co-dimension two phase. Here should be a p, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, you add up all these expressions. So for this edge, for this edge, this edge, this edge, and you multiply by uh, this constant, uh, depending only on the dimension. In the spherical case, you have to multiply it um, by 1 over n minus 1. So here comes the curvature, non-constant, non-zero curvature in. And what, what this tells us is, when you want to compute non-Euclidean polyhedral volume, these are one-dimensional integrations, one-dimensional, not n-dimensional. This is much simpler. And this volume differential formula has a lot of uh, implications. And it has also been generalized to other spaces in the same Riemannian case. And uh, it, it's really fantastic. So <clears throat> let's now look at the volume computation of this three-dimensional hyperbolic tetrahedron. Uh, here we have one-dimensional edge lengths. These are logarithmic expressions. Logarithmic expressions in terms of these vertices, which you can represent in coordinates of your space. And the, to integrate the logarithm, well, uh, Lopachevsky in the 19th century could do it in a case of a very special tetrahedron, which is a so-called author scheme. So um, we have only three dihedral angles which are non-right. So here 
we have right dihedral angles. I write them sometimes like this. Or since we are also speaking about polyhedra, which appear in terms of discrete reflection groups, or Coxeter theory, or Lie algebras, one also could write these orthogonal tetrahedra in this way. Here we have hyperplane H1, H2, H3, H4. And this graph means hyperplane H1 and H2 intersect under the angle alpha. H1 and H3, so this hyperplane and H3 is this one. They are orthogonal, so they are not connected. Not connected nodes in the graph means orthogonal hyperplanes. And so this is a very nice graphical picture to uh, write down polyhedra when they are not too complicated. Yeah. So a, a polyhedron in three dimensions bounded by 200 faces, I would not use uh, <laughs> this description. But it's anyway, it's combinatory, very difficult to encode a polyhedron uh, in a suitable way, in an efficient way, when it's not of a simple combinatorial type. Okay. So Lopachevsky, who lived at the same time like Schlafly, but somehow mathematically they didn't know so much about one another, which is a shame. They didn't have internet and email like today. And uh, Lopachevsky looked at these so-called also schemes. This term was uh, invented by Schlafly. He looked, Lopachevsky looked at the hyperbolic case, Schlafly, only at the spherical case. And uh, in contrast to the spherical case, Lobachevsky could find a closed volume formula in terms of the three parameters defining the object up to isometry, alpha, beta, and gamma, alpha, beta, and gamma, by introducing an additional auxiliary parameter which is very complicated. A square root of um, trigonometric functions, and then you take the arc tangent. And we don't know about the geometrical interpretation of theta, but it was very useful to find this formula. And uh, what is this Kyrillic L, Lopachevsky function, slightly modified? It reads like that. It's an integral over a log. We are not surprised anymore that a simple integral over a natural logarithm appears because line segments, edge lengths, are logarithms, are logarithms. And uh, so one could write this um, integral in a complex way also, very easily, and one can also write it as imaginary part of the so-called uh, dilogarithm function. So logarithm, dilogarithm function. And it can be written, if you take the imaginary part, as uh, something which is related to some L series of a certain character sometimes, or the Riemann zeta function if x is one half, uh, if k is, well, sometimes one can. So what does it mean? to have a dilogarithm. Dilogarithms appear in many, many uh, contexts in mathematics, but also in physics. Uh, and uh, they are defined like polyhedral volume in, in an inductive way. There we have the co-dimension two phases and then volume, etc. Here we take the first logarithm, this is the log of 1 minus z up to a sign. That's OK. That's a length. And then uh, we take the nth logarithm as an integral over some suitable path in a complex plane over the n minus 1 dimensional polylogarithm d log t, or d t over t. 
And in this inductive way, the uh, classical polylogarithm is defined, and it can be written as a series of that kind, which is, for number theory, very important. And the Lobachevsky functions appear as imaginary or real part if you take arguments on the unit circle. And they have these expressions. Now there are modified polylogarithms nowadays which appear in algebraic K theory, in Mahler measure theory, in, in number theory, and uh, they, are, they can be, they were modified in such a way that they satisfy in a clean way certain um, functional equations. So the modified dialogarism of bloch wigner satisfies a five-term relation where here this R2 is the classical cross-ratio of four points. Uh, yeah, and they are, in this context, they are famous conjectures of Don Zagier, who is sometimes uh, often here. Uh, and uh, they are very difficult and uh, proven uh, only for very small uh, degrees for the trilogarism, they are still valid. Okay. No, no. I, I did not speak about uh, where, no, no, they have the unipole, yeah. Otherwise you have to, you have to make some manipulation with the functional equation. Um, yeah. We should not be surprised that these, uh, that these functions appear because of Schlafly's differential formula where we also have this inductive process in going up with dimension to compute polyhedral volume. Oh, yeah. Let's go back to Lobachevsky's formula. As I told you, we have this nice property of hyperbolic space that we have points at infinity, where we have a horospherical neighborhood. And uh, let's assume that this point here, one, tends to, the, to a boundary point at infinity. And this, this point also tends to a point at infinity. What is very nice is, even if this is very brutal, uh, if you look at the neighborhood, at the neighborhood of these vertices tending to infinity, I write it like that. These neighborhoods still have finite volume. So we can look at polyhedra in hyperbolic space with as many vertices on the boundary at infinity as possible. We still have finite volume. And now comes the important point. If we do this if we construct these boundary neighborhoods by looking at a boundary component here given by a horosphere, which is Euclidean, basically, we can use Euclidean geometry here to compute the volume of these boundary neighborhoods. This is uh, very nice. And uh, Lobachevsky's formula, in that case, when these two vertices go to infinity, means... Uh, gamma has to tend to alpha because uh, yeah, beta plus alpha plus, well, here's, here I made a small mistake. No, no, it's okay. Uh, yeah, beta, gamma, and the right angle, it will become Euclidean. This means the, um, a Euclidean triangle exists if and only if. Um, Beta plus gamma plus pi over 2 is pi. Yeah? So uh, in that case, we get here alpha, pi over 2 minus alpha, and alpha. And the volume formula of Lobachevsky reduces to a very simple expression. It's one half of the Lobachevsky function at alpha. In the case of a doubly asymptotic three-dimensional also scheme. And John Milner 
derived in another way, but it's very simple now by the Slobachevsky uh, result. An ideal tetrahedron, an ideal tetrahedron, what is this? This is a tetrahedron, all of its vertices are on the boundary at infinity, so. <laughs> like that, yeah? So we are here on the boundary at infinity. Uh, it is characterized by three pairs of dihedral angles at opposite edges. And the fact that we can see them in a horosphere, which is Euclidean, makes that alpha plus beta plus gamma is pi. And uh, this formula is very simple by means of Lobachevsky's formula, and it is very important and used in SNAPIA, uh, in a modern um, software package, to compute the volume of complements of knots or links on S3. These provide very nice, smooth, hyperbolic three manifolds. They are non-compact, and we can decompose them very often in ideal tetrahedra, and uh, this formula is at the basis when you have such a triangulation in ideal tetrahedra to compute volumes of complements of knots and links. So that's why hyperbolic volume, also in small dimensions, is, is very uh, interesting. Then, of course, there are other polyhedral objects. Um, here is one a pyramid, which is non-compact. And Winberg derived this formula. And the graph of such a pyramid is this one. You can exercise at home what I mean by that. <laughs> Infinity means the dihedral angle is pi over infinity, so zero. Yeah. And uh, here the message is the volume is not so much more complicated structurally, uh, but this is um, pyramids. These pyramids, they are non-compact. You have an apex at infinity, and then you have a face opposite to this apex. And in this case, Later, I will consider pyramids where the neighborhood around this apex at infinity is topologically a product of two simplices. Okay, still have uh, some time to, to go further. Is this somewhat clear? Okay. Uh, let's go to dimension five. I said even dimensions, this, I do not want to say evident, but uh, up to dimension four and six, quite clear. So in a long, long time ago, I looked at such also schemes, so right-angled simplices, all vertices which can be on the boundary at infinity are on the boundary at infinity, and they have a maximum of right dihedral angles, pi over two. So they have uh, six bounding hyperplanes. They have a very simple graph. And the fact that the two vertices are at infinity means algebraically this condition. The cosine squared, the sum of the cosine squared equals one. This is a two-parameter family, an infinite family. It is important, but not so important that I can say any five-dimensional polytop has a volume which is a sum or a difference of these. That would be beautiful, but this is very difficult to show. I'm not sure whether this is even true. Uh, but its volume is given by this expression. Only in terms of the dihedral angles, no theta, no arctangent, no cosine, nothing, just alpha, beta, gamma, the sum, and here comes a wonderful constant, the Riemann zeta function at three, which provided uh, the constant of integration when looking at Schlafly's differential formula. Uh, this function, again, I repeat, this is the real part of the 
trilogarithm on the unit circle, and it has this expression here as an infinite sum. There are not many other closed formulas in dimension five, and I think I'm one of the few ones who has this interest still today, <laughs> even more today than before. Uh, also, I proved that many years ago. Uh, now, uh, let's go to these coxeter polyhedra. When we have an angle, pi over k, then in the, cock in the graph of the polyhedron, I just write here not pi over k for the dihedral angle, I write here k. If k is equal to 3, which appears in the theory of coxeter groups very, very often, then one just writes an edge without the three, because yeah, we do not want to write much, we want also not to speak too much, <laughs> so we omit it. The five over two means we have two pi over five, and here we write five over two. Yeah? I hope this is clear, very simple graphical notation. So this volume formula, which I had here, when you look at this condition, it is satisfied cosine squared pi of 3 plus 1 half plus 1 fourth gives 1. And the volume is a rational multiple of zeta of 3, so an irrational number. We do not know whether this number is transcendental. For this graph, for this group, which does not give a discrete reflection group. We have here 5 over 2, but we have uh, somewhat a, a quasi-discrete uh, group. Um, it satisfies the condition, and we get this expression. So the Lobachevsky function of degree 3 appears. By using cutting and pasting methods, I could even manage to compute other volumes, for example, of this beast, which is a very nice one. Believe me, it is a simplex, an also scheme, which is not compact, but a finite volume, and the volume is quite small. This one, I do not want to speak about it. Uh, it's too late. Uh, uh, but this one, keep this in mind. It is non-compact. It has one vertex at infinity. It is a simplex, and it has this value. Actually, let me now go back to these coxeter polyhedra and hyperbolic reflection groups. It turns out when they are generated by a very small number of reflections, or when their polyhedra, fundamental polyhedra, have a very simple combinatory structure, a simplex or a pyramid, then if we go up with these uh, weights here, uh, or we, we, we go up, that means the dihedral angle becomes small. So when we have the contrary, many angles which are big, close to pi over 2, by Schlafly's volume differential, the volume goes down, has to go down. Uh, so here we have many right dihedral angles, pi over 2. We have 4 pi over 3, and we have just 1 pi over 4. One might think, hey, this tetrahedron, or this simplex, gives us is a, the polyhedron model of an orbit space of very small volume. And Thierry Hild, who was my student for his thesis in Fribourg, 10 years ago, my God, the time is running, he proved that among all non-compact hyperbolic quotient spaces, so of the form you have a properly discontinuous group action, you look at the orbit space, and it has a fundamental domain, what is its volume, among all non-compact hyperbolic space forms, uh, this group provides us the space form of absolutely minimal volume. And this volume is this irrational number. This uh, orbifold, so it is Hn, H5 modulo gamma, by a famous lemma of Selberg, it has a cover 
it, has co it is covered by smooth manifolds. And actually, uh, Radcliffe and Chance could construct a cover of, this, of some uh, gluings of this one, which has the smallest known volume today. And this volume is 7 zeta of 3 over 4. I have no idea whether this is very small, the smallest at all, this manifold, because we do not have a comparison value. In even dimensions, we have the Euler characteristic. The absolute value is minimal when it is 1. In all dimensions, we, the Euler characteristic is 0. But so far, this uh, provides us minimality in some sense. In a compact case with uh, Emery, also a student at Fribourg, I did some similar work in a compact case by restricting to arithmetically defined groups, which I do not want to mention. Mm. Ah. Uh, but in, uh, the message is when we look at singular space forms, uh, arithmetic or not, uh, arbitrary but non-compact, we know the minimum. In the arithmetic case, we know the minimum. And that's basically what we know in the dimension five. Now, uh, I showed you also this Winberg formula for pyramids. I should now say, naively, if one goes up in dimensions, one would think uh, maybe coxet polyhedra, so groups generated by reflections in these coxet polyhedra, they have a very simple presentation. If the polyhedron has a, a very small number of faces, of uh, boundary, boundary hyperplanes, the group is generated by this minimal number, and the, and the relations are very simple. So hyperbolic coxet groups are characterized by very simple presentations. And naively, by looking for minimal volume space forms in higher dimensions, even or odd, a good thing is to look at coxet polyhedra with, with small weights, 2, 3, 4, but not 10. 2, 3, 4. Dihedral angles pi over 2, pi over 3, maybe pi over 4. Unfortunately, hyperbolic coxet polytops, polyhedra, do not exist anymore in dimensions beyond 995. We know that, nothing to do. We have concrete examples up to dimension 21. Richard Borchers, uh, with um, Lie algebraic methods, he constructed a coxet polyhedron hyperbolic of finite volume in dimension 21 with more than 200 facets. So I cannot draw the coxet graph. Volume is not known. So 21 is the maximum of dimension we have. Then we go down to 19. There is one example. 18, one example. They are all non-compact. And if you want to know about compact coxeta polyhedra, the story ends in dimension 8. When you ask the question, what about simplices, coxeta simplices, they have the simplest presentation on the level of the reflection groups. Coxeta simplices exist only up to dimension 9. And in the compact case, co compact coxeta simplices only up to dimension 4. That's the reason why regular polyhedra with a nice symmetry, uh, they do not exist in high dimensions. But objects with a high degree of symmetry usually are responsible for small volume. So we are looking a little bit in the dark space when we want to search for small volume. And uh, one thing to deal with this problem is to pass to arithmetic considerations. Uh, so uh, since simplices do not exist up to higher dimensions, let's look at pyramids with an apex at infinity and some basis, say a simplex or say a product of simplices. So an apex over a product of simplices. These are pyramids which were classified by Pavel Tumarkin, who is in um, 
Durham was a student of Winberg. He classified them and he showed they exist up to dimension 17. And all of them, starting from dimension 11, they are all somewhat arithmetic. They belong to some number field, to some quadratic form associated to a number field, coefficients in a number field. I will not, do not want to go into that. Uh, together with two other students I had, we classified them up to commensurability. So we looked their orbit spaces, uh, when we go up to their covers, can we describe them? And I gave a talk two years ago here. So I feel somehow at home. Uh, among these pyramids, we also have infinite sequences subject to this condition. And uh, just recently, I could produce some formula because this condition just helped. And for two Coxet pyramids with diagram 443344, four, four, believe me, it's a pyramid, just, just, take these, just take these graphs. So in di I'm, we are in dimension five. A pyramid has seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, and we take four, four, three, three, four, four. Uh, when you look at this subdiagram, it is a Euclidean triangle. Pi over four plus pi over four plus pi over two gives pi. So we have a product of two Euclidean triangles. Uh, this is a perfect pyramid in hyperbolic five space. And uh, the volume with this volume formula is this multiple of theta of three. The, uh, another example satisfying this condition is that one. Now I want to come to the end um, because in connection with hyperbolic volume, I mentioned mathematical physics with the polylogism. I mentioned knot theory, complements of links. I mentioned the Euler characteristic topology. I mentioned group theory presentations. Now I want to go a little bit to, a little bit to rationality or number theory, but there is much more in there than I can tell today. Uh, in dimension five, I have these two, the six, three, 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 six. So there we have six, three, 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 six. And this one. Uh, this one satisfies the condition cosine squared of alpha plus cosine squared of beta plus cosine squared here is one. This one doesn't satisfy that. But, uh, in our commensurability classification, uh, we also could see that they are not commensurable. So it is not at all clear that the volume ratio is a rational number, not at all. But with Schlafly's volume differential, I could numerically perform this simple integration. This is not so difficult. And when I plug this in in Paris, which is not so fantastic for numerical integration. Zack, I got really instantly eight over 35. And I was puzzled. I, I rarely had such a, a result. And uh, I'm pretty sure that this is true. But uh, still, I cannot prove it. And these rationality questions are very, very tough. If it would be true, this means that the volume of this one has to be that value. Because this volume I got here as a result of this precise formula. But if this is true, what Paris shows me, I have also this form. Now, there are strong hints that this 8 over 35 is probably correct. <laughs> because um, maybe I, I stop with this slide. When you take a regular simplex or a regular object, it has a high, a, a big symmetry group. Vertices are equivalent under this symmetry group of the object. The, the symmetry group operates, acts transitively on the vertices. And the simplex, a tetrahedron or a, 
equilateral, or a nice a regular triangle, can be decomposed in a, a certain number of congruent smaller pieces. And these are also schemes, or uh, truncated also schemes. And in dimension five, I just discovered by chance, maybe in January, or, or maybe it was in December, I don't recall, it was cold, or no, maybe uh, December, that the so-called birectified simplex in dimension five, so this is a five simplex, which has been, its vertices had been all truncated off in a similar way, and in a very severe way, in such a way that the truncation the truncating hyperplanes even intersect themselves. And uh, this is not a rectified simplex, so this means we would just truncate off the vertices in a, in a nice way. We birectify. The, the uh, truncation uh, is severe. And this gives still a very nice symmetric object. It can be decomposed into these pyramids and into six factorial pieces, and this is perfectly hyperbolic, and the characteristic truncated simplex is this one. So uh, then one could, one can deal with volume of that object in a different way. This is an arithmetical object, and uh, there, are, there is the hope that one can prove that this 8 over 35 might be correct, but uh, this is not a theorem. This is just a question. And I think with this, I stop with a last remark. So far, we do not have a single volume formula in seven-dimensional non-Euclidean space, not a single one. That's why I stop with dimension five, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>